All right. Well, uh, my name is Gaetan Landry, also known as Head Bomb on the English Wikipedia. And today I'm going to talk to you about some bots. So uh, first, what I'm going to talk about is mostly taken from the English Wikipedia as an example. But uh, the general ideas will apply to other websites, such like the other languages of Wikipedia, or the sister project like Commons, Wikisource, Wikibooks, or anything you can think of. Uh, I'm going to talk about five bots, basically, which is Article Alerts Bot, Bitcode Bot, Citation Bot, JL Bot, and Noom Bot, which you probably don't know what they do, except perhaps Citation Bot. So a bit about me and why I'm giving this talk or why you should care about what I have to say. Um, I'm part of the BAG, also known as the Bots Approval Group on the English Wikipedia. I got uh, over 100,000 edits. Uh, does this matter? Well, not really, in the sense that I'm not special. But I have experience, so in that sense, what I have to say is, uh, I guess, a bit informed opinion. Uh, I personally run three bots, which is Article Alerts Bot, Bitcode Bot, and Citation Cleaner Bot. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about them and some other bots that other people run. So what's a bot? A bot, we define it as a tool that carries uh, repetitive or mundane tasks to maintain articles. Uh, the advantage for bots is that they're fast and they don't get bored, but they are mindless and potentially uh, disruptive. Right now on the English Wikipedia, there's about 700 bots that run, and the top 20 bots together have about 30 million edits. So that's quite a high rate. Uh, the bots approval group, basically what we do is we oversee bot uh, on Wikipedia. We approve or deny the bot tasks, uh, and we're basically trusted to understand what's a good bot, what's a bad bot. Uh, but we, some, we have some downfalls. The bag, in general, uh, we are slow. Uh, we easily get bored. But on the plus side, we're mindful, and we're trying not to be disruptive. So we're like the opposite of bots. So on the English <coughs> Wikipedia, we have a bot policy. And the reason for that is if you have bots editing, like, several million edits per year, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that the bot is sound. It's like you don't want a bull in a china shop. So we have to make sure that the bots uh, follow consensus, that the operator can be trusted to communicate with the community to make sure that they can resolve problems if they arise. And we also try to make sure the bot does not waste editor time in that we don't want them to make useless edits that need poss possible review and uh, so they show up in your watch list and you say, okay, what did the bot do? And you're not sure. So you need to spend time reviewing what the bot did. And if you find out they just changed a space, uh, that's a waste of time. So there's some tasks we don't allow because they waste time. Others uh, we don't allow because of technical reasons, but those are kind of rare. Uh, other Wikipedias have, sometimes they have bot policies, some don't. Uh, so if you're from another Wikipedia or another sister project, uh, check your local bot policy if you have one before trying a bot. So the first bot I want to talk to you about is like a small bot that I run. And I, I coded it along with uh, two other guys, uh, Beta Command and Snotty Wong. And uh, they helped me code this bot, and I run it. So who cares about this bot? Well, basically, astronomers and physicists and those with interest in astronomy and related fields. What this, what a bib code is, is basically a series of 19 characters that identify, identifies an article. So, for example, uh, if you take a citation template, like the first one, you see there's an author, a year, a journal, a volume, some pages. So that's information. The bot can translate that into the bib code and then it tries to add the bib code. So the edit it makes is in bold, it adds the bib code, and the DUI is another identifier you can also find out. So it takes your citation from a plain text thing, which is Heinz WD right here, and then it adds this stuff here. These are links. You can click on that, and it takes you to the uh, NASA database on the paper, which can give you free access to the paper sometimes, if not, it gives you a link to the official version of the paper, uh, perhaps preprints, which are free. Uh, you can find out how many times the journal article was cited, and lots of other useful stuff, which helps you determine if the citation is 
a quality citation or if it's just a stupid citation that does not belong in the article, or it just gives you access to the paper if you want to consult the reference. A BIP code is not the only identifier that exists. There are many, many others for many, many other things. Uh, for example, the ISBN is the identifier for a book. So if you check a citation against an ISBN database, you can find out who the author of a book is, when it was published, etc. So you can use that database to fill your citation template with the information you want, and it saves you time because you rely on the work of other people, so it lets you be lazy. So the link between the database and Wikipedia or whichever project you have is the bot. And it's not only restricted to like a bibliographic database. You can have like a biology database for species. You can have like a impact factor databases for uh, the impact of a journal. You can have uh, geographic, geographical coordinates for where a town is or where a building is. These are all databases, and on Wikipedia, we have bots for pretty much all of them. Uh, another class of bots I want to talk to you about are the tagging bots, what we call the tagging bots on the English Wikipedia. On the English Wikipedia, we have like topical collaborations, which is uh, like if you're interested in a particular topic, for example, Argentina or physics or volcanoes, there is a page for editors interested in that particular topic. And there's a way to prioritize the articles in terms of importance and to rate them in terms of quality. So oh, I'm missing a slide, but hey. Uh, basically, you can have 15,000 articles in your topic, and you can find out which is uh, of high quality, which is of low quality. This way you can find out, well, these articles need work, and these don't need work and you can find out which is important and which are not. So you can find out basically the important articles that are of low quality, which is pretty much what the top, your, your collaboration as a whole should focus on to improve these areas. So basically, uh, if you're really interested in building a topic, uh, you have a lot of topical metadata already present on Wikipedia. The talk pages of many, many articles are tagged by Wiki Project Banners, which is the first template over there, WP FUBAR. The FUBAR stands for any topic you want. Uh, but articles are also tagged with info boxes. Like, for example, you could have info box birds, or info box city, or info box politician. And the FUBAR tells you the topic. And you also have nav box, categories, etc. So you basically have bot porn. They really, really like that stuff because you can make, uh, you have a whole metadata on a topic. So you can identify a topic by looking for these templates or categories or something like that. And an idea I had in 2008 was the article alert systems, which is basically you take all the information, all the articles you can have in a topic, and then cross check that against the various processes on Wikipedia, for example. I don't know if you can quite see, but this is for uh, Wikiproject video games. And Wikiproject video games has about 50,000 articles. So if you want to check every article individually, if they're nominated for deletion, if they're up for review for a future article, if they're for uh, proposed for deletion, if the files are wanting to be deleted, etc., that would take a really, really long time to do by hand. So you take a bot, and it does it for you, and this gives you the article alert systems. And uh, this is used by about 900 projects on Wikipedia, and it cross-checks about 30 processes in, in like discussion areas that uh, you can have. And this alert thing is, uh, it's, you can watch list it. So you don't have to check it every day, you can just check your watch list, and if there's an edit that popped up on that page, you will see, hey, something happened in my project today. And, and basically, this saves you a lot of time. All right, another topical area you can take is uh, Wikipedia books. 
Uh, it's basically a structured collection of articles that you can either print yourself or download digitally into a book format. If you want the print edition of something, uh, there's a company called PD Press that prints them for you for really cheap. And in full disclosure, I did work for them a bit, but it's still a really cool thing. So let's take uh, the hydrogen book, for example. Uh, this is basically the structured collection of articles. You can see there's an overview, uh, a list of isotopes, some reactions involve hydrogen, uh, the risk of hydrogen, and it's used as a fuel. So this is like a large topic on a very specialized thing is hydrogen. Who could think there's a book on hydrogen on Wikipedia? But you can make them, it's very, very viable. And this is done by, by human, human build books. However, if you go on the talk page, uh, we have these things called book reports. And basically it takes uh, all the articles in the book and it checks for the, like the Wiki project assigned ratings to the article. For example, the first one is FA. If you see class FA, that tells you this is a feature article. So that's a good one. You don't really need to work on it. And the next one is about anti-hydrogen. It's a C-class article, so it's of lower quality. And it's also tagged for cleanup. So that tells you, hey, there's some cleanup to do on this article. There's no non-free media, and on the far right is a collection of links to other useful tools, which I thought it would be a bigger screen, so sorry, you can't quite read it. But that's the general idea. You have a topic, and then you can cross-check that against useful information, and the bot makes the link. Another thing uh, I had an idea for, this is coded by Jay LaTunder, and what it does is it takes, uh, all the citation templates on Wikipedia, and it checks what the journal field is. So it compiles all the information you have in the journal field, and it creates a report every month or so. This is sort of what it looks like. So the top cited journal on Wikipedia is the Journal of Biological Chemistry. It's cited over 22,000 times over 8,000 articles. So this lets the uh, academic journals project, no, we should probably have an article on the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Uh, this was launched about two years ago, and at that time, you can see the fifth entry is genome research. It's cited well over 10,000 times, and we lacked an article on that topic. And this list basically told us, hey, we're missing this article, and it's pretty highly cited. So we should probably have them. And, and in the span of one year, we went from a journal that was cited over 10,000 times that did not have an article to the, uh, the most cited journal without an article on Wikipedia after one year dropped to 100, under 100 citations. So we went from two orders of magnitude just because of a list that was done by a bot. So, in general, it's okay to be lazy, but it's kind of hard work. So, bots are awesome. I really like it. If you have any questions on bots or I I bots in general, uh, these are the links you want to go, like WP Bots or WP Bot Pol, which is for bot policy. And on the English Wikipedia, if you want to request a bot, if you have an idea for a bot, uh, just go to WP Bot Rec. And you don't have to be English. I mean, like we have a lot of bot coders that really are good coders. Uh, and some of them speak other languages. So if you want a task to be done in another Wikipedia or in another sister project, uh, we welcome you to apply there and make a request. And we can't guarantee that someone will pick it, but you have a chance that maybe someone speaks your language or maybe it's interested in your project and you can like, sort of tap in the talent pool we have on the English Wikipedia. Pardon? That, that was from the English Wikipedia, but it could be like, that doesn't have to be an English journal. Like German journals relatively cited often enough. 
I don't know. I, I'm not from the German Wikipedia, but presumably the German Wikipedia would have a the equivalent citation template, and there would be a journal field or whichever is the equivalent name, and they could also build this list quite easily, and that would let them know uh, where to prioritize their work if they want to cover academic journals. I'm um, sorry, I, I came in late, so uh, I may have missed this. But uh, the the dr when you uh, were able to find all the article uh, template, the citation templates. Yes. Um, how did did you use the API to do that, or uh, were you working through some dump data, or how how did that work? Uh, for the citation templates, it really depends on which task. Uh, for the journal list, it's done from a data dump, just because it's a lot faster to to crunch these number. And we really don't need that list to be updated that often. So for us, the dumps are fine for um, for the journal list. Uh, for bibcodebot or citationbot, then we just use the API, and you, you fetch the article. If it's missing something, then you add it. You can also use the data dump, but you'll have to edit from the live article. So in the end, y you can sort of use the dump to create a basic filter if you want but you'll have to use the API. Uh, Are there any uh, arguments to that A alert lot bot? If there are arguments, like uh, bickering or fighting? <laughs> parameters. <laughs> oh, parameters, yes. The, <laughs> the, the lists are uh, customizable. There's, there's a, a subscription template that handles uh, what exactly the project wants. They can exclude uh, certain field, uh, certain processes if they want. Like if they don't want to be notified of deletions, like few projects want that. But suppose you don't, you're not interested in deletions. You can exclude deletions from the alerts if you want. Uh, it's it's quite customizable, but unfortunately that bot is very specific to the English Wikipedia in that it's it's very localized. So. The idea translates really well to many, many other Wikipedias, but the bot version we use would not work well on other Wikipedias. It would have to be coded from scratch again. Uh, it, it depends on, the question is, what is the code of the bots? Uh, which, which language? Um, BibCodeBot uses uh, PayWikipedia. And this guy right here will talk a bit about more about that. Uh, citation bot, I think, is done in PHP. Uh, article alert bot is done in C sharp. And or sorry, um, yeah, C sharp. And uh, JL bot, I have no idea. It depends on, on on the programmer, I guess. Use whichever language you're fine with, and it's all fine. Uh, also, we don't require the source code to be open, but it's encouraged. Uh, so for these bots, uh, most of the code is available on the bot stock page or on the bots page itself. Or you can just contact the operator and request the code. And very often, uh, they will be glad to, to collaborate. Any other questions? I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. Oh, that explains why you speak English so well. <laughs> well, technically, I am French. <laughs> uh, although I notice, I notice a slight accent yeah. at times, but you, for the most part, you can't tell. So I just want well, to Well, thanks. <laughs> yes? As a follow-up to the language question, um, I've been having difficulty as a first-time bot writer to, I've been getting a lot of advice to write my bot in different frameworks, both Python frameworks between MW client and PyWikipedia bot. And I was wondering if there are any uh, efforts to integrate projects or what's, what's the history and the future of integrating similar language frameworks um, into one Uber framework so that I don't have to have a headache of making decision before I write anything. I'm not the best coder in the world, so I'm not really super qualified to answer that question. But I believe that P Wikipedia, the Python Wikipedia database, or the code base, is, is sort of like that Uber framework. 
you're looking for. At least that's what I've been led to believe from other people. And I'm a guy that I can't code from scratch. I need something else to modify and then go from there. And someone else coded the basic of BibCodeBot for me. And then I expanded that from maybe 200 lines of code to like 2,000 lines of code in a week and a half maybe. Uh, it was hard work. A lot of it didn't make sense to me. But I managed because... And I, I'm a guy who never learned Python at all, and I could use P Wikipedia fairly fairly easily. So I think that's the one you're looking for. But uh, there might be some other languages, uh, other code languages, um, yeah, languages, programming languages that, that also have Uber frameworks, but I'm not aware of them. Well, you're always welcome to the bots page. Just go to uh, WEP bots and just ask on the talk page and for sure someone will have that answer. Uh, just a comment to the previous uh, question. If the person knows uh, some language and works as a software engineer, he or she has a uh, favorite language. So you just pick up the framework in this language and uh, extend it. If you don't know programming languages or you are not a software engineer, okay, you take the P Wikipedia and this is a framework for you. That's all. Uh, what do you mean competing? I have a framework by myself, uh, but uh, there has uh, unique functionality. It works with a document object model of uh, articles. It's another framework. Do they compete? Yes, a bit. It's different task uh, and in different languages. Well, I guess that's that. So. If I'm Ryan Lane. I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. I'm the lead for the Wikimedia Labs project. Um, who here is familiar with, with what Wikimedia Labs is? Who here is a user in Wikimedia Labs? Ah, this is going to be a tough room. <laughs> <laughs> so for the people that don't already know what, 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 what Wikimedia Labs is, it is a community-managed virtualization environment that's meant to treat our site infrastructure like we do our projects, <coughs> meaning that anyone can make changes, meaning anyone in the world can make changes to how our sites actually operate. So as a little backstory, um, the sites were originally built by volunteers. Um, everything about it, everyone that built the site had full root access. They were not staff. We had no staff. So this has changed over time as the projects have grown and we have this foundation and we have staff employees and the staff are now basically fully responsible for running the sites. Um, this is something that we feel is a trend that we would like to reverse. So instead of having nothing but the sites, the, uh, the staff running the sites, we would like to get the, the volunteer contributors doing more changes on our sites. And so like the staff currently breaks the site continuously, we would like the volunteers to break all the things just like us. <laughs> so the question is, what kinds of things can we break together? We have, uh, we've moved three things that were previously staff only into areas that are now available to the general public. And by that, I mean anyone can view it. But additionally, um, anyone that signs up for an account can change these things as well. The first one of these is uh, a repository for software that is called Operations Puppet. Who here is familiar with what Puppet is? OK. So I'll give a quick explanation of, of what it is. So Puppet is basically a programming language that is what's called a declarative language. So instead of a language that says, I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to do this thing, it says, this is what I am. So 
when you're doing things in the operations world, you're creating servers. On those servers, it's going to run things. And you're going to say, this server, this server is going to run Apache, um, MediaWiki. It's going to have PHP installed and all of these kinds of things. You're, you're, you'll take that. And for each different type of server, it's going to be declaring what it's doing and what it is. So this operations puppet repository is all of the programming language definitions. It's all of the classes and manifests and files and such that actually define how all of our servers are, are configured. So with this, you have the ability to pull down this repository, see how we operate, make changes to this when you see that there's either bugs or that we're missing something that you think we should have. And, but additionally to this, so instead of just being able to make these changes and push them in, you need to have some place to test them as well. So we've created this infrastructure that is virtualized. And who here is as, uh, familiar with Amazon EC2 or Rackspace Cloud or something like that? So in those environments, you make an account. In that account, everything in that is owned by you. You can make virtual machines. You can um, make public IP addresses. You can manage firewall rules. You can have storage. You can basically build your own entire infrastructure. So what we've created to go along with the opening of all of our repositories is this environment that allows you to create, have projects created for you where a project is basically like an account on Amazon EC2. Inside of this, you can create virtual machines. You can create as many as you want. You can have them linked together however you want. And you have full root permissions on these things. And so inside of these, you can use our puppet manifests. And you can build your own Wikipedia-like environment for your own testing and development for both MediaWiki and the site operations themselves. Additionally, um, MediaWiki itself is configured, and the, the configuration files for those have always been public, but they've never really been changeable. Like, you can push patches into Bugzilla and things like that, but you can't actually, like, physically change them and push them in and just have them code reviewed and deployed. With this, we've now moved all of that into a public Git repository that's in Garrett. You can push your changes in. You can reconfigure your Wikipedias or wiki sources, wiktionaries, et cetera, in ways that you would like. So instead of having uh, to do the consensus part and then putting in a bug and waiting for the site operators to do this, you can do all of, all of this, wait for, and then have the bug approved, and then the site change can just be pushed out for you. Similarly, um, something that was not available before was our Apache configuration itself. Um, most things are in Puppet. Apache is not. It's deployed a separate way. We've now released that as well. So basically, every th entire service that we're running on the site is changeable by everyone. So this project is about nine months old. In nine months, we've created 104 projects. That's 104 community-managed infrastructures. We have about 100 and 89 live instances, which an instance in the cloud terminology is a virtual machine. Those are spread across all of the projects. Now, since the nine months, we only have 189 instances running. But in that nine months, 822 have been created and deleted and things like that. That's um, roughly the amount of servers that we actually have in production. And in the nine months, we've added 520 users. So the users for this is shared between um, our software development and our operations. But um, previous to this existing, we only had about um, probably 150 active contributors. Um, so we've added quite a few since then. Additionally, this is the storage and memory being currently used. So we have about a hundred, uh, one roughly one terabyte of storage that's actually used from the virtual machines themselves. We have seven terabytes of storage that's in shared space for all of the projects currently being used. We have about 227 gigabytes of memory from the virtual machines being used in this infrastructure, whereas 480 is actually allocated. So realistically, the virtual machines could use up to 480 gigabytes. Now, 
with this kind of growth in nine months, as you would think, everything's kind of working as expected. <laughs> this is an example of how things are going. So this is a graph. Um, this is the memory usage of the virtualization cluster. This is really from a, uh, a few months ago when we were having some, uh, some serious growth issues. We're in kind of a stability cycle right now for labs, so less features currently coming in, but more uh, stability. So this memory graph actually shows two outages. The first one, as you can see, the, the purple at the top is what's called swap. The green is buffer space. The blue is memory in use. So total memory actually being used on the cluster at that point in time was 200 gigabytes of memory, which at that point in time was the amount of hardware we had. So we were using far more memory than we actually had available. So as you can see, swap, 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 dead. Reboot. <laughs> and then the memory grows back up, swap, death. Memory comes back up, kind of a repeated cycle. The graph on the bottom so it shows the CPU usage. So the CPU usage of the infrastructure isn't really that high, because most of the things that are actually occurring are more memory than CPU in the cluster so far. But there's this one portion of that CPU usage that's always terrible to see, always. And this is the um, I await. This is where the virtual machines are waiting on like disk I.O. or network I.O. or something along those lines to actually do any work. When that's occurring, nothing else is occurring. So that's one example of, of this. Now let's see how, what happens on an in, one, one individual host inside of this virtualization cluster when this kind of thing was going on. Kind of normal, kind of normal, kind of bad, really bad. So. In the stability cycle that we've been doing so far, there's a few things that we've been doing to kind of fix this problem. One, and anyone that's ever been on the IRC channel has probably heard me complain about this, we're using GlusterFS as our storage backend. It doesn't really work very well for our use case. Um, and this, the fir very first thing we did was to split the I.O. into instance storage and project storage. Project storage is shared between all instances inside of a single project. And the instance storage is storage that's local to each virtual machine. So by splitting these out, the operating system and all of its actions are going to one set of storage. And the users and all of their actions on storage are going to a separate set of systems, which ideally should split the workload between two completely different storage clusters. Uh, another thing that we've done is we've added a lot more hardware. So, so far, the, the now right now is actually kind of a lie because a few days ago I added three more pieces of hardware which has stabilized the infrastructure for now. But currently we have um, one zone which is a data center. We have one controller that kind of controls all of the infrastructure. We have four compute nodes where each one of those compute nodes has 48 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 12 cores for processing, and 1.2 terabytes of storage. Soon, we're going to two zones. We're going to have one. Uh, we're going to have one zone in our Tampa data center, and another one in our Ashburn data center. Inside of each one of those, we're going to have, and I should say, we're going to have seven compute nodes in Ashburn. We're going to have seven compute nodes in Tampa. Each one of those compute nodes is going to have 185 gigabytes of memory. Where's Ashburn? Um, Ashburn, Virginia. Virginia. Sorry. Um, so total memory out of the entire cluster will be about 2.5 terabytes of, of uh, memory and roughly uh, 8 terabytes of local storage. We also have about um, 100 terabytes of usable project storage for these things as well. So by adding these new clusters or these new nodes to the cluster, we can kind of see how the graph has changed. Looking really bad, looking really bad looking especially bad. So this was actually a, a, a kernel bug that came from the leap second. We can ignore that. That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so then kind of back to being terrible, added some new nodes. The wait time went down. So as we uh, bring in more hardware, that kind of stuff goes away. 
Also, we're going to try to reduce unneeded I.O. So each one of the instances is doing a ton of logging that it, they don't really need to be doing. Um, there's a lot of workloads that can be shifted from being on the instance storage to being in the project storage. A number of these other kinds of things that we can just eliminate that are not needed. Um, also, right now, the way the architecture works, we have a set of compute nodes. The virtual machines run on top of these compute nodes. Then we have a networking node. So when, these, when the virtual machines talk to each other, they just basically talk to each other. But when they talk to anything external, they have to go through a network node. In our current architecture, we only have one of these. So there's a huge bottleneck for I.O. When too many instances talk through the network node, it gets its link for communications gets saturated, and everything waits. So to get rid of this problem, we're going to turn each one of the compute nodes into a network node so that the virtual machines, when talking, talk through themselves and out. So additionally with this, we will eliminate a single point of failure. Because in the current architecture, if the network node dies, everything dies. Whereas in the new, the new one, if one single compute node dies, only the virtual machines on that compute node will die, and the rest of them will continue to run properly. So another problem is that there's really a lot of things to have to do inside of this project. It's massive. So some of the things that this project requires is MediaWiki development, OpenStack development, which is the virtualization technology we're using underneath, um, and all of these other services, along with community coordination, because this is meant to be a community project. And really, the majority of the work is meant to be done by people that are contributing as volunteers. So one thing that we're doing for this is that we're scaling our people. Sarah, who's in the audience, I see her back there, is uh, working part-time with us. She's doing operations, kind of general operations inside of labs. We have Andrew Bogat, who is now doing all of the OpenStack development. And we have Phaedon, who is uh, also doing operations, and he's full-time helping me out with a lot of things. So. This is kind of the current state of things that we're doing for stabilization. But for the current feature set and what we're going for feature sets, um, labs, the uh, initial, uh, initial vision was really for something called test dev labs. It was the thing meant to bring volunteers back into our, um, I into our operations. So the current features that we actually have for this, and all features are per project, because you're meant to have an entire infrastructure for yourself that your community fully manages. So for each one of these, we have shared home directories. We have shared storage. You can manage who has root access on which virtual machines or who can run certain commands on certain virtual machines with heightened privileges by per project sudo. Every project has its own POSIX group. So in between projects, you can give additional access to people and other projects inside of your projects by setting group permissions and things like that. Um, we have per project ganglia, which Sarah was nice enough to give us, <laughs> so that you can monitor the resources inside of your own projects so that you can see if things that you're doing are, are not performing very well. We have per project Nagios. So if virtual machines inside of your infrastructure are having problems or services are having problems, you can go and you can correct them. You can get pages. You can get notifications on IRC and things like that. Um, we also have per project Puppet. So that when you're building infrastructure that you want to have inside of your project or moved to production, you can test all of your changes inside of your own project before you push them in the code review. And we also have Debian repositories per project, if you're using Ubuntu Precise and above. And for this, it allows you to create uh, Debian packages and test them inside of your own project, install them on all of your own instances before you push that into code review. So basically, it lets you have a full testing environment for everything that you need to do before it ever tries to go into production. The things that we have planned per project we would like to have uh, databases per project, and not meaning like you have a virtual machine that's a database, a hardware database where you can say, I need this database for this purpose. It gives you back a username and a password. That user can make um, tables inside of the database, et cetera. 
Um, we also plan on having reverse proxies, because one of the problems that we have right now is a lack of public IP addresses. They're very hard to get. And so we've been limiting the amount that we actually give out for public IPs. Having a reverse proxy, since the majority of the work that people are doing is web-based, we can give people a reverse proxy. It has one IP address. It can talk back to all of your different web services, and you don't need a public IP. Um, we also would like to have load balancing, remote execution, meaning inside of one instance you can say, I want all of my other instances to do these things. Um, and additionally, improved Puppet support, because the current Puppet, the way the current Puppet um, changes work is not very nice, per se. So we're going to make this work better per project. Additionally, there's a second part to the lab's project. So the initial vision was to have this um, environment where volunteers can come back in and do work in our production cluster. But there's also th some things that we already have that are very nice. A tool server, has anyone here used tool server? Especially the bot people, right? Yeah. So inside of tool labs, or so to inside of tool server, you have the ability to run bots. And you can, run, you can uh, write tools that people from the sites use or embed in the sites as gadgets and things like that. But you also have like replicated databases. And you have these other really nice kinds of things inside of this environment. So we are already starting to move towards this Tool Labs vision of integrating all of the tool server features. Um, in the current implementation, we have a way to make an instance and say, install MediaWiki with everything, have it just come up and run. We also have a bots project. So I was actually really glad to be placed after two bots talks because I should have a bunch of bots people in the room. So inside of this bots project, you can run your bot, and it's meant to be community um, managed. So if someone happens to go, go away from the projects that ran a bunch of bots, Another group of people can take that over, which currently is somewhat of a problem in the tool server environment. So we're looking at kind of getting away from that. And also, we would like to start pulling the bot code into source code repositories so that we can keep the code open and, and available for everyone to run so you don't have to request the code. It's just there for you to use if you need. Um, additionally, right now, we have public data sets available. So if your bot needs dumps to run, all of the dumps that are available on download.wikimedia.org, or is it dumps.wikimedia.org? Dumps. Are available on a block file system that's shared to every single project in, the, uh, in labs, read-only. So planned <laughs> <laughs> replicated databases. We do not currently have replicated databases. Um, we have some other things like a demo project where if you're writing a MediaWiki, in, uh, in, if you're writing a MediaWiki extension and you want to show this to people, then you need somewhere to actually show it to people, right? So having a demo project where anyone can see what you're working on and doing is a planned thing. The tools project, which is going to be moving the tools off of uh, tool server into labs, um, replicated databases, of course. Um, public statistics would be very nice to have. We have this available at like stats.wikimedia.org and a few other places. Having these in some public way so where you can do research inside of labs would be nice. Um, a bot scheduling service so that it makes it easier for people to run bots in some sane way. Um, and an analytics infrastructure. So um, the staff is currently um, adding in analytics infrastructures like Hadoop and some other things. It would be very nice if we could open this up in some kind of way, maybe not direct access, but some kind of way so that everyone can run some kind of job. Now, there is a problem, of course, that there's private data that can go inside of a Hadoop cluster and things like that. So we're going to have to work out ways to not violate privacy policy. But um, that's basically it for the planned things for that. So. The database replication, I very much, much want to emphasize, is coming. We have plans for it, how it works. And the tool server right now, it's kind of painful in how it works. They have um, all of our databases replicate off to tool server, which is in um, a cluster in Amsterdam. And then um, the data comes across. It gets 
multiplexed by something called Trainwreck, <laughs> which, as you can, as you can think from the name, is exactly that. And then it brings that into another database cluster where the data is filtered. So what we're going to do is we're going to have all the databases filter into something called Tungsten, which is a MySQL proxy that has the ability to filter and multiplex. And then from there, we're going to replicate to database servers in an Ashburn and in Tampa, Florida, so that will be available in both zones. So that said, this project is community. So we could really use a lot of help. And we can use help in a number of different ways. Um, we can use help from the perspective of changing things in production. We can ha use help from actually building the lab's infrastructure itself, because you can build labs inside of labs, and then probably inside of that, maybe inside of that. <laughs> and um, also just from the perspective of like helping out with the projects that are inside labs as well. We have a ton of projects. We have like bots, we have Nagios, we have the deployment prep project, which is meant to be like a clone of the, the cluster that you can test on and things like that. So from all of these things, if you would like to help out, there's the Wikimedia Labs IRC channel. There's a Labs L mailing list. And of course, there's, uh, if you find bugs in anything, there's the uh, Bugzilla project where you can put things in. Any questions? I think you were first. Yes, pardon me as I have less knowledge about these kinds of things than anyone else in the room. But uh, recently, one of the tool server clusters, I think it was Nightingale or something, went down and drove a lot of very valuable things to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. And in the aftermath of picking that up, it was realized that there really wasn't a functional procedure for what happens if one of the more important clusters grinds to a screaming halt. Um, is there going to be redundancy built into labs to minimize downtime, or are we at the that's way too expensive because we'd have to double things stage right now? Um, so we are actually doubling things right now. Um, we're going to have we're going to have two we're going to have two zones that are in separate data centers, and in those data centers, everything is replicated. Now that said, if you want to have redundancy for some of your more important things, you're going to have to build it in two places like you as the person that manages your own infrastructure. So we're going to have all the infrastructure pieces that are required for that to work. But if you want a tool, if you want your tool to actually work when an entire data center goes down or something like that, it's something that you're going to have to build for that. Now, like bots, for instance, are probably easier than some things, but yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about what people are actually doing with labs right now? It sounded to me like you're getting a clone of the uh, media wiki or the Wikimedia infrastructure and play with it. But what, what are they actually doing with it? So um, if you've seen any of the demos this week, So for instance, here's one thing. This is uh, beta, uh, which is in the deployment prep project. This is meant to be a complete clone of the uh, Wikimedia infrastructure that runs the projects that we can run full integration tests on. So whenever, um, whenever new things come out for extensions or we want to do a new release, we can put this into beta, and then we can run a full suite of tests against, uh, against it to make sure that it's not going to break the production site before it happens. Um, This is um, reportcard.wmflabs.org. This is the analytics people's um, tool that they're actually using to show usage statistics of the site. Um, so these are the kinds of things that people are building inside of labs. Also, there's a number of bots currently running in the bots project. Um, there's there's a hundred and something projects, so it's really hard for me to go into this. So, so they get data, uh, so they get access to the actual log data? So this is, this is using public data sets. So I use Brock to I'm sorry? 
that? Or um, I, I think they're pre-computing the data and moving it to labs for demoing. Yeah, so at some point in time, we're going to have more open data sets. I keep, I'm very bad at spelling. <laughs> Do, don't I work for a for profit? So, some other projects analytics, blah, 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 blah. Blame maps, bots. Let's see. I'm trying to find a, a good one to show you. So, why all the red links? Those are people that don't have user, user pages. Uh -huh. So if, you, uh, did, if anyone saw Brian Vibber's talk today where he showed the um, embedded JavaScript in content pages, that was also running on here. So a, a lot of what's running on here is, um, is basically um, test and development work. Is there anything on this one? There's something on it. It's just not at that URL. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> -ha. So someone, for instance, is testing Etherpad Lite inside of labs so that we can use it in production and stuff like that as well. They've puppetized the, um, the Etherpad installation. They're moving it across and stuff like that. So any other questions? That was, else. that's Ganglia, yes. And is, is that an independent uh, application, and does that sit on top of Ganglia? No, it's independent. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the, uh, two, two quick questions. I think it's a very interesting presentation. At, at least I've been doing data analysis for five years now with Wikipedia data, and I've started salivating like Pavlov's dog uh, <laughs> after this. So uh, two quick questions. Um, is there any... Um, Established procedure. I know you are still in beta, but uh, do you plan to publish uh, some sometime soon an established procedure to get new accounts for the yes. infrastructure? Yes. So um, soon we're going to just open registration so you can create your own accounts. There will be no more registration process with the exception mm -hmm. of just doing it. Okay. And the, the second quick question: uh, Do you plan to consider any way to federate other? Uh, big uh, data management infrastructures because I know there are some ongoing uh, efforts right now to build uh, similar infrastructures. I don't know if exactly like this one, mm -hmm. but with the same, <coughs> more or less the same goal, the uh, same overall goal. So could it be possible to federate uh, multiple uh, data management uh, centers, so to say? So if we have um, integrated authentication of some variety, um, we have integrated in authentication for this one cluster, but we would need things like OpenID, OAuth, um, which MediaWiki is uh, currently lacking support, at least for OAuth. But um, yes, it would be nice. Uh, two short questions. Maybe not short answers. Uh, what resources will Botov have? Like, yeah. uh, what resources will Botov have? Like disk resources, CPU, memory, etc. Mm -hmm. Maybe other limits. And second question is, what pink and visible unicorn thinks about your project? <laughs> so, from a resources point of view. Um, our plan currently is to scale to the amount of resources being used by you. So if you want more resources, you create a larger instance. If you need eight CPUs and you need 16 gigabytes of memory, you create an instance that has that much. Now we ask you kindly to only do that if you really need it. But um, basically, yeah, the idea is however much resources you need is what you use. And the unicorn loves it. <laughs> How do you submit new projects for like review by administrators? Um, so basically right now we have a, a group of staff that approve projects. Um, really, really, we would like to open project creation, but it l leads to um, 
very disturbing security vulnerabilities to do so. So basically the idea right now is to talk to one of the people that are doing this, either in the, um, the list, Bugzilla, IRC, or something along those lines, and just discuss what the project's going to be about. That way we know it's a human that is requesting it and not trying to steal a billion resources. What IRC channel? Wikimedia-Labs IRC channel. Any other questions? Great, thank you. If, if we don't have any questions, I have, I'll uh, just mention um, something about, you, you spoke about breaking stuff, and he spoke, uh, spoke about boats, so I have something that connects both of it. A couple of years ago, uh, the, the developers on the foundation side decided that they will move from 5.0 of Unicode to 5.1 without checking with the uh, Malayalam Wikipedia, which broke the main page and pretty much every page that used a special <coughs> letter that was changed in it. Yeah. So we had to write a null, null edit board to uh, do that. So we do break stuff and we try to fix it using boards. Yeah. <laughs>